Hi, everyone, and welcome to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. Wendy has spent the last two years helping women with various stages of endometriosis to heal naturally after putting her condition into remission. After her own healing success from stage four endometriosis and adenomyosis, she's inspired to heal others, and her goal is to help some of the 175 million women know that there is another way other than painkillers, drugs, or surgery. This is the place to be for real talk with real people for real results so you can learn how to heal your endometriosis naturally. Please note that the opinions expressed in this program may represent options but are not a substitute for proper medical care. Before starting any new healthcare program, we recommend you consult with a health professional. Hey, it's Wendy here, and as always, I hope that this podcast finds you well. This week's subject is called Analysis Paralysis, and that perpetuating petulant perfectionist. This week, I've been working with a fantastic group of unique people, preparing for some very exciting new material and events for next year. More will be revealed in January. However, it was not an easy decision to get there. It has been more of a combination of years of analysis paralysis, plus a petulant perfectionist. Before I explain how and why, I should explain in more detail these phrases. The phrase analysis paralysis describes a situation where an individual overanalyzes or overthinks a situation or thinks so much that they find no solution and then take no action and thereby become paralyzed, i.e. cease to progress forward. That has been me on a few occasions. Let's discuss what I mean by perfectionism. Perfectionism can be an admirable characteristic, admired much in many people for many particular acts. Yet, if it is combined with other elements like overanalysis, perfectionism can become draining, overwhelming, spiraling downwards into fear of failure, criticism, and of course, making any form of mistake like a line of dominoes falling down that perpetuates into experiencing anxiety, sadness, fear, feelings of inferiority and low self-esteem. So perfectionism in moderation can be a good thing as long as it is in balance with other parts, but not when it develops a mind of its own and seeks no relief from the endless, this is just not quite good enough mantra. So after years of analysis paralysis on many fronts, and recognizing what to do when it happens, i.e. journal, meditate, and of course take counsel from other safe people, I made a brave decision to step forward and out to help more women with endometriosis globally. Inviting external teams into a system was a big step. It's a big step in terms of investing further in my business to get this vital message of hope and healing out, but also my broader expansion and exposure into the world personally. I may have mentioned in the past how a part of me still resists this at times and seeks to remain in the shadows. Yet I am continually compelled to keep progressing forward to inspire women with endometriosis to know that there is another way, as far too many women still believe endometriosis is a life sentence. And that is so untrue and one of the biggest falsehoods and fallacies in the medical field. Yet women don't know what they don't know. Therefore, I will forever feel obligated to share there is another way so to as many women as I can. Even this week, as another amazing group of women completed the End of Boss Academy, I felt such delight for them as they had come so far and become a boss of their endometriosis, a coveted official End of Boss. I feel inc- incredibly proud of them all as I know how hard they have worked and how ill they were at the start many of which had forgotten how ill and in pain they were. To see their growth and healing is phenomenal. My end of all students have been brilliant, furthermore dedicated and uber resilient, even during sad times, bad days, and the days they felt like giving up. Although we have a tremendous end of boss team who provide the all round support to ensure that that never happens. These awesome women persevere despite COVID, despite toxic people, and despite life trying to divert and interfere with their desire for a new path. I love working with women who've had the, who have the steely resolve, dedication, and determination. That's why I pride myself on creating something unique to allow women to progress, grow, and of course, heal physically and emotionally and spiritually. 
It's an honour and a privilege to watch the growth and transformation that can occur over six to nine months. The right environment must, of course, be created to allow the safe, secure and sensitive passage to a pain-free body by establishing the root causes of the pain, inflammation and hormonal imbalance. One of my favourite phrases I can hear myself say often is, this journey is not easy, but it's definitely worth it to get to the other side. And I promise you that if you're listening to this, I promise you it is definitely worth it to get to the other side. So my incredible Endoboss team and I celebrated and we all gave thanks for having the honour of partnering these awesome women to the other side, ceasing their pain, increasing their health and internal peace. So it is results like these that keep me motivated to keep moving forward and outward. I have to keep sharing these success stories and messages of hope and healing. My brilliant business coach is always encouraging me to put myself out there. And as I said, I admit to having some resistance to it. That is until now. Over the past five years, I have created, produced and been carefully testing my many online programs and pathways to ensure improvements and results are achieved for every single woman. There is no point in promoting empty, heartless programs that achieve zero results, like some people without a moral conscience do. Recently, I was accused by some toxic troll individual that I was only helping women for money, in inverted commas. These people are ridiculous with projections of their own internal motivator. How could that be true when I have calculated that I've plowed over six figures of my own money into this business over the past five years? And I also make a loss every time a woman takes advantage of my free paperback book offer. But I'm prepared to take that hit if it gets my book into women's hands and that I, they get the message uh, that it helps them to heal their body. My message to millions, that's my mission. That is a legacy I wish to leave behind. A legacy where words like natural or naturally are not scoffed or mocked at or ridiculed by the medical profession anymore. One day I would like to be someone who stands in front of medical students at the very beginning of their decades long training and share all of my endometriosis success stories. And you will be able to read more of the success stories that have happened so far in my additional upcoming book called Endometriosis Naturally Success Stories, which is due out in March 2021. If money were my motivator, I would have reopened my property business many years ago after I'd put the condition into remission. But that business did not nurture my soul, feed my spirit or fulfill my purpose. Those who tout about money and make it out that is somehow evil miss the point. Money is just a promise of exchange of services or goods. Money is just a tool and money is always replenishable. But time isn't. And time for many women with endometriosis is wasted in torment in their beds, hugging the hot water bottles and being plied with pharmaceutical poisons that only worsen their symptoms. You may know my story well by now, but those who don't, the old medical machine pathway had me ending up disabled and bedridden for two and a half years. What I came to realise at that time was that my organs were nearly failing me. I was knocking on heaven's door. The physical, mental, emotional and spiritual anguish I experienced during this time was devastating. Thoughts of ending my life frequently occupied and swam through my mind. Doctors didn't know what to do with me and called me an enigma. So now when toxic toads and trolls question my motives for why I do what I do, I ask them in return. So, so let me get this right. So what you are proposing is that I should have kept all this vital, important information to myself and selfishly disregarded all of the women suffering in the world who might have benefited from this. Is that what you're telling me? This invariably silences them and they scurry back under their stone. Motives. It's essential to understand and question one's motives to establish their why. Actually, when I coach online entrepreneurs at the very beginning of their own journey, I actually come in a bit deeper and start with the who before their why, but more on that another time. From your basic instincts comes the resounding confirmation that the person marketing to you is genuine or not from their motives. It saddens me now to see the increased number of charlatans, vagabonds and predators who've moved into the endometriosis field and are marketing with vigour to women with endometriosis. Some of these people, and yes, some are men, 
are very misleading and feed into the despair of women who've had their hopes raised and dashed so many times it makes them feel like giving up. There are a few genuine people in the space, although I do remember feeling a little perturbed when some have shared that they do still suffer from pain and symptoms of endometriosis every month, yet masquerade that they don't. But let's be super clear, I don't. I don't suffer any gripes or pains or niggles or symptoms of endometriosis or any of the other many conditions and symptoms I used to have before. I hope that you find when I share this again and again and again, I hope that you find that this is inspiring for you to achieve too. And this is why I do what I do. If I can do it, then I know you can too. Of course, with the right support, education, information and direction. That is my point. There are many people masquerading in the endometriosis field who have not cracked the code. Although I so wish that I could help them to be completely pain-free too. I heard one of them the other day was promoting the flushing of a female body part to heal. I was in quite a bit of shock. This is highly inaccurate and misleading advice. It is a ludicrous approach that many women may fall for, feeding into the quick fix mentality we're all addicted to, and then feel let down and then be left upset when another thing doesn't work. I used to be drawn to those ideas many times on my journey in the past, it is essential in this journey, though, to always ask the question of the person you seek the support. If these people have not managed to put their own condition into remission, then how could they possibly guide you to do that? Equally, if it is a non-medical man who is offering guidance on endometriosis, yet he has never experienced a monthly cycle or pain, then you have to seriously question his motives. It's the age-old misconception of the snake oil salesperson he would stand on his cardboard box professing a miracle cure, reinforcing this belief that one single product or treatment is the magic answer. Yet again, let's be clear, it's not. There is no magic one cure answer. What works with endometriosis is systematically working with what God and nature gave us. Identifying the toxins and poisons that come in in their many forms and slowly swapping them out to let the body heal. That's just what it does naturally. It is the multimodal approach, my ladle protocols, and the five Ps that deals with the whole body and the whole person. It supports the whole body to do what it always wants to do, which again, worth repeating, is to heal itself. If ending endometriosis was a quick fix, in inverted commas, then there would not be 175 million women suffering from it. There would not be millions of surgeries carried out every year that fail women time and time again. So this is my motive. This is my motivator. My deep motive is to share that there is another way than what we're brought up and conditioned to believe about the painkillers, drugs and surgery. I want to ensure that a woman hears that there is an alternative option so that her instincts immediately sit up and take notice. For it is pure common sense that a human body heals itself. It has been doing so for millions and millions of years. This is nothing new. And this is well before the medical machine had been created just a little over 100 years ago. So I admit that I struggle to fully relax and, and not be working on sharing this message every single day. There's always a small voice at the back of my head that is saying, Wendy, what about all these women out there in deep pain and despair? Keep going, get this message out to millions. Time is ticking away. So this step of employing the services of these external teams of people is a giant leap forward for me. I made a pact with myself that the analysis paralysis had to stop and my perfectionist had to have faith that I was going to be supported by the right people. As the title of Susan Jeffers book says, I felt the fear and did it anyway. Psychologists say that normal children are born with only two natural fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises and that all others are environmentally acquired. The famous psychologist Sigmund Freud spoke of a person who was genuinely afraid of snakes, but who lived in the heart of the African jungle, yet of another person who neurotically feared that snakes were under the carpet of his city apartment. Normal fear protects us. Abnormal fear par causes paralysis in us. Most of these acquired fears are snakes under the carpet. I love the ac ac put my teeth in. I love the acronym of fear: false evidence appearing real. 
Even Martin Luther King Jr. said, normal fear motivates us to improve our individual and mutual well-being. Abnormal, abnormal fear always poisons and distorts our inner lives. Our problem is not to be rid of fear, but rather to harness and master it. So I decided, okay, I have to master this fear. Yet the fear of the unknown also brought to the forefront my perfectionist. Perfectionism is an admirable quality, as I mentioned earlier, but not when exercised to extremes and combined with fear. Perfectionism in psychological terms is a personality style defined by a person's concern with striving for that flawlessness and perfection and may be accompanied by critical self-evaluations and concerns regarding, regarding others' evaluations. Perfectionism drives people to be concerned with achieving unattainable ideals and unrealistic goals. Welcome to a very big part that has dominated my life, which is not really surprising given my conditioning and heritage, yet so much harder to separate from and allow it to merge with other parts. I realized this about myself late in life when it led to chronic depression and lowering self-esteem. I believe that within each of our psyches, we have an array of parts and characters that have their own individual needs and personalities. Referring back to Sigmund Freud again, he also mentioned that we had shadow parts and other psychologists have followed in his footsteps to discuss parts like the internal critic, the pusher, people pleaser, etc. But the perfectionist dominates many people who have grown up with constant criticism and fear of getting anything wrong. Many of the women I get the pleasure to work with have a strong perfectionist part. And of course, I love them for it because the perfectionist has its place and wants to get it right. But sometimes the perfectionist can be a bit pesky, petulant and inhibit progress. What I mean is, it has its clear and apparent strengths and we do not want that perfectionist element to disappear, but more to come into balance to allow the other, dare I say, fun and creative parts to get a little light. So much of my encouragement to my Endoboss beginners is to start to learn how to have fun and let a little play and relaxation into their bodies and life. Although this is where my pesky, petulant perfectionist part is still in training too. So I wanted to share my transformative experience of managing my perfectionist part as I continue on this journey. So my new and extern expanding external teams were instructed to embark on a broader range marketing. The marketing campaign is designed to, to reach more women with endometriosis and the support on offer and that endometriosis is not a life sentence. So as a result, I was asked to, to record some video material for them. One of the tasks was to make a recording of a script that had been carefully written out for me by the scriptwriter after our last meeting. Simple, I said, looking forward to it. No problem, I had thought. I host webinars and online meetings every week and I've done so for years. This will be easy and dare I say might even be fun. Famous last words. Oh my goodness, my perfectionist went into overdrive. So the past 10 days have been an enormous challenge for me. My original thinking had been that I would print off this script without giving it so much of a glance. And then I anticipated that I would just get it all bashed out in one take. Not a chance. The first take was awful. There's no other word for it. I had a total brain freeze. The second take was just as bad and had the added humour of my son blinking with both eyes as he indicated the video was recording. And for some reason, I got the giggles and thought this was hilarious. And um, we had to keep recording this time after time. Then, as we stood out in the park, the wind whipped up and the Scottish rain made its regular appearance and drove down in bucket loads. My son and I were both drenched, but at this point, still in good spirits. No problem, I had said to him as we ran indoors to our apartment to take cover from the rain. I will go out tomorrow and try again. This will be super easy, I said. How hard can this be? I laughed heartily again. Well, over the next four days, I stumbled and stuttered and struggled to even get a full sentence out of my mouth in one fell swoop. Delivering the script word perfect was becoming like a nightmare. Slowly over the days, I was developing this newfound respect for actors and actresses on the TV and, and in the movies. 
logically the words made sense, for they were mine, just redrafted a little by the writer, and so simple a child from kindergarten could have read them. Then it started to get embarrassing and I could feel the stress mounting within me. I messaged the team several times and apologised for the ongoing delay and explained that something was going wrong and I couldn't quite figure it out. I got lots of great advice from many sources. I concluded that it might be best to have a day off to break the pattern that had developed and then retackle this brain block from a few different angles at the end of the week. It was suggested to speak the script in several ways to try and break the pattern. To speak the script super fast and then speak it super slowly and then even to sing it. And then finally not to stop speaking the script no matter how many mistakes were made or how many words were fluffed. Well, again, my perfectionist went into overdrive and became even more petulant. What if it wasn't perfect? What if I was a laughing stock? What if this was a total disaster and I could never get this done? How embarrassing. So after my day's break, the recording started again on day five. I was a little bit more reserved this time and a tiny little bit pessimistic. I stood in the park, determined to get this done in one take. Yet I had somehow thought it was a good idea to also bring my enthusiastic 12-week-old puppy out with me as well. Not quite sure what I was thinking at the time. Perhaps it was more a case of moral support, but it was a big mistake. Huge. I was plagued with Poppy, my pup, frantically running around my legs, tying me up in knots as the lead wrapped round and round my legs, meaning I had almost face planted fall onto the grassy ground. Well, recording recommenced again, she started to chew her squeaky toy and enjoyed exercising her enthusiastic jaws up and down so vigorously that no words could be heard above the noise on the video playback. Perhaps trying to kill two birds with one stone as the saying goes, meaning I tried to achieve two aims with one action, i.e. take Poppy for a short walk and record the video together, was not the best idea after all. Take three of the day was interrupted when another dog in the park decided to bound across to greet Poppy and bring its owner. The owner seemed oblivious to the fact, despite obvious signs of recording and filming equipment, then proceeded to ask what I was doing. By this stage, I was rather exasperated. Take nine was disturbed by a dishevelled young man playing with his motorised toy car at high speed back and forth in the background. That noise again drowned out my voice. Take 11 was ceased by young children involved in a screaming competition. Take 17 was interrupted by the ambulance sirens screeching at its highest whilst it passed by. By this point, I was cold and miserable and feeling a big fat failure and very close to tears. How hard can this be? I shouted to myself, exasperated. I had envisioned this recording to be a simple and even fun task, but I was struggling and I was getting increasing daily reminders and messages from the teams asking me where the videos were. I could feel the pressure mounting. So never one to be defeated, I came up with the inspired idea of downloading a teleprompter. Yes, I thought, that will do the trick. And I was renewed with optimism and glee. Ah, but how wrong I was. So the teleprompter was a great idea in that it provided the words, but they were either moving too fast or too slowly, or were too small or too big. And I still had to do take after take after take of mucking up, fluffing words, and continual brain freezes. When I was nearly at the point of admitting defeat and feeling like giving up, I decided it might be best to go for a walk in nature and then have a meditation. After my meditation, bingo, it occurred to me that I was perhaps preventing progress due to my petulant and pesky perfectionist part. Yes, of course, I still wanted it to look good and be professional, but my perfectionist was a huge problem and needed to be reined in and needed some help. So I called my amazing daughter, Maxine, and asked her to come round and assist me. I admit to feeling dazed, confused and dumbfounded by what had been going on over the past six days. 
Yes, there was the usual nonsense and irritancy of the day, work issues, but I'd had a successful week in many areas. Yes, there was a real reveal of an angry, abusive, toxic person whom I'd once previously thought of as close, but more on that in another podcast, but my underboss team were dealing with that. So what on earth was going on? Maxine zoomed round like a superhero with her cape on. A big beaming smile greeted me as I opened my front door. Despite having spent 12 hours with 26 children aged seven to eight years old, her spirits were open, kind and generous. We can do this, mum, she said with glee, and I believed her. I had to. I had no choice. The clock was ticking very loudly and I was feeling the deadline pressure mounting. So after a quick debrief of all the shenanigans, some amusing and some not so, we started to brainstorm more ideas to appease my perfectionist and allow filming to commence. Maxine had very sweetly printed off all of my scripts onto paper for me, so I was filled with even more newfound optimism. I can do this, I said, with greater enthusiasm than I, that I felt. I had to be positive and optimistic. I couldn't fluff in front of my daughter. I wanted her to be proud of me and not see me mess it up again. I couldn't fall to the ground weeping and wailing and banging my fists on the ground in frustration as much as I wanted to. I can do this, I repeated out loud over and over and over again. So with some new tools, including a fancy microphone to, de to deflect the, the horrible Scottish easterly wind and a new wide angled lens so I could keep focused on looking down the barrel of the lens rather than have my wandering eyes, off we trotted without Darling Poppy this time across to the park. We were optimistic despite the failing light of the day, which was disappearing fast and bringing with it a new damp, cold weather front. It took longer than expected to get the equipment set up and Maxine had to improvise by putting some of the equipment down the front of her scarf so that she could leave her hands free to sift through the script pages for me as I spoke. The first few takes resulted in stomach clasping laughter as the camera slipped down her scarf and sloped off to the right. Then I unexpectedly and energetically jolted the microphone out of the video, forgetting I was attached to it as I walked away. So as the daylight dimmed and the street lights glistened, we did a good, decent take, albeit with a dull, dark night background. My optimism was renewed. We laughed our way back home and reviewed the filming over a delightful gluten-free pizza and a glass of wine and prepared for the next day. I woke up feeling more encouraged than I had done all week. So we were up bright and early to set off again to the park with determination, again leaving Darling Poppy behind. The decision was made. We were not returning until the filming had been done. So take four of that day had Maxine's fur trim coat showing the edge on the film. Take seven had the script pages entering into camera's view as she dropped each one in line with my speaking. By take 11, we were utterly exhausted and close to hypothermia. The Scottish weather had turned nasty into a bitingly cold wind. And although sunny, the temperatures had felt near freezing. But this time we'd been outdoors standing still in what felt like sub-zero temperatures with only two thin layers of clothing for over two hours. Our fingers were almost blue with a cold and losing sensation and my nose started to stream. At the last minute, my pesky perfectionist relinquished its tight control and agreed to have some fun with the script to present it in a different way. Maxine also decided to throw the printed paper script into the bucket and instead hold her mobile phone up as a homemade teleprompter, which just happened to work a treat. We laughed again some more at all that we were doing to get this to work. Such fun memories. Her poor arm ached as she diligently and determinedly kept her phone in the perfect position so that my perfectionist could relax and for the first time in six days, read the script and wait for it completed in one take. Maxine and I were in shock. What had changed? It was done and it was perfect. And it was a wrap, as they say in the movies. So what had changed? We looked at each other in shock. What had just happened? How could I have struggled for six days yet deliver the result in under 20 minutes? 
my perfectionist, my pesky, petulant perfectionist. Actually, I think it was more my fearful perfectionist had stepped to the side to allow me to have some fun with the filming and without the pressure, something had shifted and relaxed. There's clearly a time and a place for perfectionism, but I've learned on this journey, there's also a time and place for fun too. Sometimes we put such pressure on ourselves to be perfect that it inhibits us from progress and completion. I reflected about how much time I'd spent trying to get it right, trying to get it just perfect. How distressed I had got, yet accomplished the square root of nothing, but yet more distress. So it's a lesson. It was the same when I self-published my first edition of my book, Heal Endometriosis Naturally Without Painkillers, Drugs or Surgery. Was it 100% perfect with spelling and grammar, etc.? No. But did it help women have hope and help them heal? Yes. That helped thousands of women. It's helped tens of thousands of women now. It was then when my finger hovered above the publish button that my perfectionist went into a cold sweat. But back then, perfectionism was not an option. I did not have the money to edit it or get it edited in the way that I wanted. But I had hoped that the woman would forgive me and read my heartfelt message and feel inspired by my success story instead. Now, as the second edition of my book is about to be launched next month in January, my perfectionist has had some time to come out and delve deep into this edition. All parts are proud of all that I have produced because I have had to overcome tremendous fear and trepidation in doing so. I recognise that my perfectionist part is just trying to protect me from toxic, critical and nasty toads who would pick holes in a Picasso. But as time has gone by, I keep focused on my mission. I'm thankful for my pesky perfectionist and that when it relaxes and allows creative parts some light, I get to help share my message and help other women with endometriosis shine and become an endoboss. So another reminder about embracing your emotions and parts. So my special thanks go to Maxine for coming to my rescue and enabling a super compilation of amusing videos for our memory banks. And the filming of the script, well, you'll be hearing more about that and what exciting things I have planned for you in the next few weeks. So how is your perfectionist preventing progress or causing fear with you? Remember to journal and to go out into nature and consider mindfulness, relaxation, meditation to connect back to what is happening inside you. For all the answers you seek lie within you. Next week, we'll be finishing the year off as I talk about the endometriosis secrets and the five Ps. But until then, keep looking after yourself. Keep your number one to your health. Thanks for listening to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and rate us. If you're interested in learning more, you can download your top five jumpstart tips at healendometriosisnaturally.com and jump on the VIP email list. Remember to keep you number one. The world needs a healthy you.